Cool. Hi, everybody. I'm Matthew Broberg. I want to talk to you about how communities are more uh, than the sum of their parts, as are the metrics that we use to measure them. I have tried to measure pretty much everything. I've worked at startups and enterprises. This is a very industry-focused talk as opposed to some of the academic ones. And you'll see that I'll hold a lot of opinions that don't necessarily have statistical models behind them. And we'll <laughs> talk about that after. But I've measured everything from page views to things I'll never quite understand were expected of me to daily active users, um, monthly active users, everything you need to try to make money with open source. This is also probably going to be a little American in the framing of open source. But let's start with psychology, because I think it's a good reference for us all to understand. In the mid-1900s, or early to mid-1900s, behaviorism was all the rage. It's this idea that we are behavioral uh, creatures, that when you give us an input, you get an output. It's all behaviors are a result of that experience that we're uh, participating in. And there are two classic models. You can think about uh, a mouse pushing a lever and getting a pellet and doing that over and over again. You can think about ringing a bell and a dog uh, drooling, the Pavlovian model. Uh, but they're both ideas of which uh, creatures interact, humans as well. Um, there, it's a really strong uh, statistical, a statistically backed way of understanding human behavior and creature behavior. Uh, it's, it's helpful because it's, it's observable, it's easily measured. Um, it, you can see modifications in behavior and then be able to modify them again. So there, there's a lot of scientific validity to it, but it also holds its weaknesses. It's unable to really understand the, the human aspect of things, the feelings, the moods, explaining all the reasons why. So at a similar time, there is this counter argument coming from the Gestalt community. And Gestalt says that the whole is more than just the sum of its parts. Um, we One of the classic ways in which you see this, you may see a duck, I might see a rabbit. We are both, in fact, uh, seeing the same object, and they are both, in fact, true. And that is a way in which uh, we are being uh, there's an allusion to this, but there's also something that's clearly very human about it, that we are fooled, but not fooled at the same time. They're both, we can hold both truths simultaneously. Um, and there are a number of other laws that were discovered and tested methodically, so there, there's a lot of metrics and science and really interesting research papers behind that, that show that by the law of proximity, despite this being just an incoherent number of blobs, we see a Dalmatian, or the fact that most to all of us will see a triangle here, even though no triangle actually exists. These are ways in which our, we are mentally modeled to see the world in, in patterns. Uh, and it tends to contradict the idea of behaviorism. If it was a simple input receiving output, how could we see things that don't exist? So we have this idea of both lever pushing creatures where we get pellets and would do that over and over again. We have this idea that we are complex creatures that can perceive multiple truths simultaneously. And uh, I'm not here to, to decide something that happened uh, in the past or to say one is right. It's actually both truths can be held simultaneously uh, because they're both models. They're ways of understanding the world as they exist. And they are um, models are ways of understanding what we believe to be reality, but it's actually an, uh, an imitation of the reality that we're living in. Um, and all models are wrong, but some are more helpful than others, which is a good transition into modeling the statistics that we use around communities. So. I've always worked for enterprise businesses, and businesses love business models. We are surrounded by them. There's the classic one that is effectively as useful as this diagram, which is not useful at all. This idea that we are all, all companies are engines, that if you put the right gears together and you put the right information in the top of the funnel, you'll poop out some sales on the back side of it. Um, this is something that we all kind of live in that existence where th this is something that uh, people are funding billions of dollars based on this belief system, this sort of model. Um, you know, maybe a more structured one, a more uh, one that will help you get some VC funding comes from the Harvard Business Review, a sort of business case model where you understand your revenue streams and your cost structure and all these different ways that if you fill in these boxes, you will get funding. Um, then there's the one many of us, if anyone's worked in a corporation or even nonprofits, they have org charts, which is another model, where we have all these different t lines of business that are important by some definition that I haven't looked up, but somebody believes it's important and we keep pushing it as important. And we have all the classic ones, sales, engineering, marketing, support, and wait, community, uh, maybe not community, because sales makes money for an organization, <laughs> which I hate to admit is actually what companies need to do. And then you have engineering, which is producing a product that's one step removed from the money. Go on, marketing is about leads, getting people in, loyalty and support, and then boom, community. We produce hugs 
And then what do hugs produce? We, we hug each other more. Like we're all about that sense of belonging, that sense of purpose that we collectively build. Uh, but it is a far cry from the monetization strategy that whether we like it or not, we are seeped in if we're in a corporate environment. Uh, so what is our model? What is our community model? If you're in a community team, if you're in a developer relations team, I'm going to kind of meld those into two because they have some commonality. And we'll talk about why we're measuring things so that we can maybe get to a model, what we're going to measure, and who uh, we should be focusing on as we measure. So one of my favorite models on how to think about why we're measuring is to think about where we are in this axis. Thank you to Matthew from Hoopy. Uh, which does some great consulting on DevRel. But he has this idea of uh, small companies have different goals than large companies. And technology first companies, like if you sell a server or if you sell a service, you're a technology company, versus technology as enablers. Think about like all the car industries or the bank industries adopting a bunch of technology in this digital transformation and using software to do something else. Um, you have different goals on each of them. I'm gonna to stick to what I know, which is above, I've only ever worked at tech uh, first companies, and I found this pattern, this generalization, this model to be true in my career, that when I'm at a small company, we're always desperate for revenue. That if you're not making money, whatever you're doing in community will al always end up evaporating away. And when you're at a big company, community is this function of reputation. You're trying to stand out, you're trying to be important to something or someone, and that's where your funding is being derived from. Uh, so thinking about that and thinking where that leaves us as this kind of dangling appendage on the org chart, we don't actually get to live as our own appendage. We end up rolling into something else that already has inherent value to somebody who's funding us. So on the product side, you end up being user-centric or you end up uh, helping de derive some sort of code value or user experience value. And it might be in product management or whatever you want to call it org chart wise, we can get into that. Um, but ultimately you're trying to help build a product and that's your value source versus marketing where we're very content centric, that way we can be justified in the sort of marketing funnel concept, um, or you're focused on that reputation, that intangible value. Uh, either way, you're living on some side of a community split brain, where if uh, knowing where you are in this is incredibly effective to being able to do your job effectively, um, on the marketing side, you get to just build content, and if you know that, you know how to prioritize your work and be effective. Uh, ultimately, you probably have more budget because events roll up into marketing, and so does swag budget rolls up into marketing. And it's really about the longer term investment in a customer relationship as opposed to the short term sales or the short term cost benefits of a support organization. Well, on the product side, you're building a product. You have to care about the release cycles. You have a lot of time to get hands on, but you might be a little bit more distance from that budget that you think you need to do your job. Um, or you might be this kind of unicorn magic person in the middle where you get to be community first. You, maybe you are your own org chart in a small startup. But um, what I found in my career experience is that you're actually here and you just don't know it. You're in a corporate <laughs> purgatory where you have multiple org charts that uh, matter to you and either one can defund you in some way that will end up harming what you've built, the people that you've gathered together in your community. Uh, and that's really what I'm always trying to avoid. So. When I say why we measure, you have to understand why you keep your job. Uh, and by keeping our jobs, by keeping that sort of funding stream in a corporation, you understand the value you're being uh, paid to drive for the company, and that means you get to continue to build that community and sustain it for the long run. Uh, without a comprehension of that, I find uh, these, these programs that I build end up floating away, and you get removed into some sort of the new hotness that's happening in the technology community. Um, so moving into what we try to measure, we have our raw uh, data that feels like it's you know, uh, just kind of glossing. It's, it's not important in a, a really deep sense. It's the, the GitHub stars that everyone's chasing, the page views that we all talk about, the talks that we give, I'll get a little tally mark for today. Um, but if you try to remember why we're measuring these, it's for popularity or attention or adoption or monetization, depending on where you are on that first axis. So if we think about what we're measuring, I mean, I have to give a plug where it's due, like it's easier than ever to measure the right things. It's built into chaos. It's supported by Batergia. You have incredible support, incredible tools that it's easier than ever to get it all in one place and aggregate it and see that additional value. So the what is the easier part than ever, um, but the, the metric isn't necessarily in that what. I, I want to draw a distinction between raw data 
the data that is the input to something and the metric, the thing you're going to use to, to grow and add value to something. And we get to choose our metric, but we don't get to choose our data necessarily. The data is either there or not, we can gather it or not, but there are distinct, there's distinctness and there's power in understanding what metric you're choosing. So when we go back to this idea of page views, page views, yes, they're boring, yes, it's a tally mark, but if you measure them as a comparison to something like how much you're spending in AdWords, and if I am bringing in a number of page views for keywords that are very expensive on Google AdWords, I can be telling you I'm saving the company millions of dollars uh, with time. That's actually a way in which I've gotten funded in the past. GitHub stars as a point of comparison. Uh, blogs written per week as a way of getting like mid-funnel content for your sales organization. So it's about like what function and motivation you're providing your organization to keep funding what you are doing. So if you get one thing out of this talk, I hope it's this. It's that there, uh, when we're thinking about the metrics that we're gathering, I think we think about it as one big blob of the things we're gathering. But I find it very important to have a distinctness between the sort of measurements that we're taking to improve what we're building, the communities that we run or ourselves, um, and those I call internal metrics. They're ones for self-reflection so that you can understand what have I built so far? How long does it take to build it? How good is it? What's the bus factor of it? More often than not, that's incredibly valuable, but it's not necessarily why you're funded. That's not what people care about from a corporate hierarchy point of view. Uh, Self-improvement is the same way. All the things we want to do in which to improve our organization, make it easier for new contributors, have people on a contributor ladder, like those are internal to us. But uh, what we often forget to do, or I have forgotten to do most of my career, and I, I advocate very loudly for now, is understand how we have external metrics. Ones where we're marketing ourselves effectively, where we're saying why people should care about our community, while we're talking to our organization and managing up effectively, uh, which is a term for managing up your org chart. So why does your manager know that your community is valuable? Why does his or her manager know, or their manager, and so on, up to the CEO if you can have a corporate sponsor that high? Like you need to understand what the value you're deriving for the organization so that you can continue to do that. So internal and external are of great value. Um, so what do we measure? It's always going to end up being a comparison to something that your organization already cares about. Um, I find like the more I try to bring new metrics in and like do a little song and dance and convince people it's valuable, uh, usually barking up a tree that I don't quite understand. Um, sorry for the mixed metaphor, but the idea is like you need to understand why people care, and then you talk to them in a way that derives, whether it's financial or reputation, you need some sort of function that already exists in another team, and to use that as a point. So here's an example of a time where I tried to make an argument uh, that uh, I thought was really witty. So let's talk about the ROI of stickers. So stickers, we've got a table of them, they cost money, they're not free. Uh, if we think about the amount of money it costs to produce, produce content that uh, gives us page views, those page views are a form of reputation and visibility. So if I was going to fund people to make stickers, uh, a number of employees, a certain amount of time, I could derive a, a number that's about five cents to seven cents uh, per page view if that, those articles are read often enough. If I think about stickers the same way and I make some smart assumptions, that let's say like only one in 10 are actually used, and one in a hundred of the people that take a sticker is a speaker at some conference, and you'll see them on the back of their computer like so. Um, and those, those talks are recorded like this one, and it's posted to YouTube, and it gets millions of views. I can get to some sort of number where it's about one cent to less than a cent per, per page view for my pretty sticker. So which one is more valuable? I can say that stickers are five times to 75 times uh, as valuable as a, a random blog post that you're going to throw up there and hope it gets some page views. But I've also found that when somebody asks what the ROI of a sticker is, they're not saying what the ROI of a sticker is. They're saying, I don't trust you in your work, that your job is actually a bunch of BS. So to uh, think about what sort of more competitive ways in which we can uh, talk about our community to be effective, uh, page views is a great pass through for Google AdWords. Uh, if you do some research on what AdWords are competitive and what, where you're ranking, you can have a really powerful comparison on your hands. When you look at GitHub stars, they're irrelevant on their own, but it can be really interesting if you're in a large organization and you say, this project got to this number of GitHub stars faster than any other project we've ever produced, and that's why you should fund us, and that's your keynote-worthy slide, um, you know, Mrs. CEO. 
right? Um, or talks given that can be about the customer references you're getting to you or community advocates you're building, something to connect you to something of value that already exists. Um, another way, if you're looking for a newer metric and something interesting that's as diverse as our community, I have to give a shout out to Mary Thingval. Uh, she's the author of The Business Value of Developer Relations. She's this idea of community or DevRel qualified leads. It's this idea of anytime a developer relations professional can um, bring somebody into the organization that's valuable to another part of the organization. So if you talk to somebody here and they end up being a great sales lead, that's a DevRel qualified lead. If you get some product feedback and get that to the right product manager, if you end up recruiting somebody that gets hired by the company, these are all ways in which communities are wildly valuable, but we've never had an aggregate metric that is meaningful enough to get it up to somebody and they understand why. Um, so there are advantages. I think it's really interesting. It's a powerful metric. It's a unifying metric for all the diverse work that uh, professionals like us do. Um, but it also has its weaknesses. It aligns to kind of a sales terminology. Maybe you want to avoid that correlation. Um, but in the end, it's, it's a little untested right now. I, I'm really looking forward to research on how that goes in practice and see if it works in certain environments. Uh, another kind of interesting model that you can apply is the most valuable user. I read it in a Viterjia blog post that I really enjoyed. This idea that you have these preferred or important users that you care about. Um, they can be, you know, maybe early in the sales cycle, pre-qualified leads. They can be open source contributors that you're reaching out to. They can be just a list of influencers that a certain team cares to reach. If you give, uh, if you scope a project around them and you talk about them, I think it has incredible advantages when it comes to the story that you're going to end up producing. Kind of packages up the diverse work that we do that doesn't necessarily make sense to everybody and explains it in a way where like, okay, I targeted this group, we did this stuff, here's what happened on the back end. So maybe it's not one or the other, maybe it's both, that the DQL concept could be that core metric that drives a lot of community work together, and the MVU concept can be part of our model, the community model of how you are successful as a community leader inside an enterprise tech company. So if I were to offer a community model, it would be this. It's to understand why you're funded, to work through what plan uh, you can have to measure what you're doing, understand who you're doing this for and who you're talking to, standardize on some sort of comparison that's already valued in your organization, and then uh, communicate those results really strongly, understanding that you need to manage up, you need to market your work effectively. Uh, it's not just gonna happen because you got a bunch of pull requests or you got the right people at the table. Like, it's gotta make sense to those that are funding it. Uh, and I think it's important to not just report on the raw data. As I already said multiple times today, dumping 40 metrics on somebody's plate is just as useless as giving them zero. Uh, it's better to, and it's better to not argue ROI, but to understand like what value you're deriving for who, and then package up your work in a way that's effective. And ultimately, yeah, report on it regularly to get your point across. So to bring us towards uh, conclusion, yeah, all models are wrong. Some are more helpful than others. Metrics are not the end goal. It's about the stories we're trying to share and measure internally, externally, and uh, ultimately, the behaviorist type work is the data that you're working on, and the metrics are that gestalt. It's the more value than you can derive just from the raw. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to your time. <laughs>